welcome to Rebel Speak and be encouraged. And um, we've been traveling. We've been having some different just family things. But anyway, I'm going to read today from beautiful Matthew. Uh, just some of these chapters of Matthew are, are so inspiring and course correcting. <laughs> course correcting. This is Matthew 5, verse 30, 43. Excuse me. You have heard that the law of Moses, and kind of there's a whole series of Jesus taking on the law of Moses and perfecting it, bringing it higher, lifting it, lifting it, not using himself as a model and saying with, in light of who I am, you are to be so much more. We're not to ask what, what, what's the least I can do to get by? We're to, we're to have a heart orientation that's deep, deeply reflect, reflective of the heart of God. You have heard that the law of Moses says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. <laughs> I want to look at Leviticus 19.18, which is being quoted. Never seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. So it, it teaches to love your neighbor, which is a broad definition. But Jesus is going to take this idea of neighbor and apply it to even your enemies, which the law of Moses, it's interesting he says it, it teaches you to, to hate your enemies. It's comfortable. I could say the law of Moses is comfortable with hating the enemy, but we are to love our neighbors. So to love those within our vicinity or connected to us somehow, right? People aren't living outside their people group. And so here we have Jesus lifting, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So love your neighbor is, right, from Leviticus 19. Hate your enemy, just there's a comfortability in the law of Moses with hating your enemies. There's a comfortability in the Psalms of hating um, usually they self-correct, like, oh, may this happen to them, may this happen to them. It's kind of like, God, your will. You know, there is a little self-correct, but there's a comfortability with the concept of hate in the Old Testament. So it says, no, you've heard from the law of Moses, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say love your enemies. And, and what might that mean? What does it mean to love our enemies? Pray for those who persecute you. So one, pray for them. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, capital F. And so, again, in Jesus, there's revelation of who God is. There's revelation of what God is like. There's revelation of God's orientation towards God's enemies. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, and that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust too. God's not behaving pejoratively against those who persecute him. If you love only those who love you, what good is that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. Those who love those who love them, that's, that's nothing special. It's also, I, can, I think we can say nothing redemptive. Verse 47, if you are kind only to your friends or to your brothers, how are you different from anyone else? And I think it's interesting there's a call to be different assumed in this verse. Our, our lives are meant to be notable, and it's going to say why. Even pagans do that, but you are to be perfect. And I, I'm going to finish this. Even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I've talked about this many times that often our, our idea and understanding of perfect comes more from, um, from Plato. Then it comes from Christianity. That that kind of that I'm not perfect, but that's the idea that Plato had this idea of a perfect triangle that didn't exist that was somewhere else. But I can I can imagine it perfect. And often when we're describing perfect, we're using that kind of Greek concept. I I can imagine a better version of myself, and I'm not she. But but here I'm to be perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. That's perfect in love. It's perfect in kindness. It's perfect in forgiveness. It's perfect in gratitude. It's, it's perfect in action. Not, um, it's not preemptive perfect. Meaning, what does that mean? It means that I get to fall down 
and get up <laughs> and go forward. I get to do it again. I get to make mistakes. I get to, I get to love. Mm -hmm. I get to pursue kindness even if I didn't the first time. I'm, I'm not exempt. My finitude, I'm not at war with my finitude. Plato's idea of perfect has us at war with our finitude. God's idea, Jesus' idea of perfect here doesn't have us at war with what, what we are, our finitude, what we don't get right. I'm just going to read it again. I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> in that way, you'll be acting as a true child of your Father in heaven. It's, it's helping us see God's stance towards us how God's cheering us on, how God's for us, even when we are yet not for him, how we might be standing in a situation right now where we're kind of really against God. And guess what? God's not against you. God's for you. <laughs> That's good news. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight both to the evil and the good. God's not differentiating. God's, God's wanting good things for everybody. God's heart is toward all. Mm. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust too. If you love only those who love you, what good is that? <laughs> Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. That's their definition of corrupt because they don't, the tax collectors don't treat people fairly. They're actually oppressive to the people they don't care about. And they treat their own family and friends very, very well. They're in a position to do that. So he's choosing corrupt tax collectors, especially because of how they treat some much better than others. And who are the ones that they treat much better than others? Those that they are related to familially. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. People that don't know anything about God or God's love do that. But you are to be perfect in love. It's an orientation of love. And it looks to God and says, God, how have you loved me? I will love others that way. How have you forgiven me? I will forgive others that way. And the New Testament's really clear on this. In fact, because we've been forgiven so deeply, we forgive. And I just want to say there's, there are moments when forgiving is very difficult. There are moments when people's judgment of us is so incredibly unfair, so incredibly dishonest, so incredibly unkind. They've come to conclusions about us that are so wrong. And, and you, you sit there and you think about it and it's deeply offensive. And the one good thing I can say is that God is as offended on your behalf. God is not this kind of love that has no the right way. God takes into account the costs. God hates injustice. And it's because we trust God's perfect love and how that perfect love moves in moments of injustice. God takes his time, but God is faithful. God's so faithful. When people are wrong and crooked, unjust and unfair, God doesn't sweep it under the carpet and say it doesn't matter. It matters deeply to God. When people are suspicious of us in ways that aren't true, and they come to bad conclusions about us that aren't true, the one thing God doesn't want is you and I running around coming to wrong conclusions about others. Because God knows, God knows what it's like to have wrong conclusions continuously drawn about you. Continuously, Jesus is under understood, and God is People come to horrible, like if there were a God, he must be a jerk, as the sun's always shining and redemption's always moving creation forward, right? God, God knows so much what it's like to be slot, um, slighted and underappreciated. And God knows how that hurts when that happens to us. But because God's forgiven us, we're able to forgive others. We're able to say, you know what? I know God will deal in this situation and circumstance to my advantage. To my advantage, I know God will move that way. Even as you've come to a conclusion about me that really does hurt, it fundamentally under-represents me. It, it fundamentally maligns me, perhaps. 
But because I know God sees me so very rightly, and I know God's love is always right, and I know God can act, and God can separate bone and marrow, and God can, can move in a way that lifts me up without crushing another, I can forgive you at great cost to myself, perhaps. I can, I can forgive your under, <laughs> your less than desirable opinion of me. I can do that. I can do that because God does that. And because God's grace has met me in my life. God has been kind to me where I've often myself found fault with others. God has been kind to me. And so I turn around and I'm kind. I'm kind in unexpected situations where one would not expect kindness. I can move forward in kindness and I can move forward in forgiveness and I can even move forward in situations that seemingly are to my disadvantage because of the nature of God and redemption and goodness and perfectness as it is expressed through Christ on the cross for my life and for your life. And if you're in a situation where you feel that you're walking in disfavor and that disfavor has been so costly, I want to tell you that you can take that situation and nail it to the cross. You can nail it to the cross and know that God's forgiveness is going to make that situation triumphant. God's going to turn it right. He's going to turn it correct. <laughs> it's what God does. It's who God is. It says God is so for you, nothing can stand against you. Not your enemies. Not those that, it says you're blessed when people say all kinds of evil about you. You're maligned like the prophets that have gone before you. There's something about God that walks into situations and circumstances and makes things right. Makes them benefit us. God wants to turn the situation in your life that looks and is against you in such a way that it benefits you. It what It's what God does. It who, it's who God is. So I'm just going to read this one last time. And I'm just going to say my heart is with you. My prayers are with you. I've really seen how prayers, I'm going to talk about that in the next talk for tomorrow, how prayers change reality on our behalf. Prayers change reality on our behalf. And I'm going to read this over you. But you are to be perfect. You get to love perfectly because Christ's love is in you. When he's writing this, it's not even fully in them yet. But he knows it's coming. <laughs> His spirit alive in us. Oh, you get to be perfect like God. What a privilege. You and I get to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Christ made a way. I get to forgive people when they're falling short and aren't very nice and aren't very kind. I get to be perfect. I get to love and forgive them. I get, I get to wish a better reality that way. That's a privilege. God blessed. God bless you. God bless you. Be encouraged.